Hi, everyone. Welcome to Revved Up for Sunday, a lectionary podcast from St. Mark's Episcopal Church in New Canaan, Connecticut. I'm Rob Schwartz. I'm John Kennedy. And uh, Reverend Elizabeth is still away on vacation right now, and Father Peter is off on his sabbatical, so you've got John and I. And for those of you watching uh, the video version, you can see I'm rubbing off on John. He has uh, ditched the collar today for a t-shirt like me. So It's true. Father yeah. Peter's going to come back and just find utter chaos in yeah. the church, I think. He won't know what's happened. <laughs> But uh, today we're going to get a little conflict management from Jesus himself. So uh, let's see what he's got to say today. Today's reading is from Matthew chapter 18 verses 15 through 20. Jesus said, If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Whew. Yeah. All right. So this is an interesting one to get into. It um, is. John, do you want to kick things off for us, kind of situate us a little bit? Yeah, yeah, I'd be happy to. So this skips a little bit. We leave off Matthew in um, chapter 16 with the confession of Peter and then the reproof of Peter, where uh, Peter first gets it right by saying, Jesus, you are the Messiah, and then gets it wrong by uh, disputing the idea that he would have to be killed, and Jesus calls him Satan. And uh, <laughs> then we jump over some stuff, and then we, we're landing in chapter 18 now, and this is known as part of the fourth of five discourses in Matthew's gospel, and uh, it deals with, this particular passage deals with, of course, a church discipline or church order, procedure for conflict within uh, the church, and um, it uh, is, is situated in a longer discourse about uh, communal life, instructions for communal life, perhaps after Jesus has departed, after Jesus has been raised and ascended. So it talks about how greatness, not our passage for, the, for today, but some of the texts we skipped over to get to this passage for today, talks about how greatness in the kingdom of heaven is not defined by, you know, might and power and conventional, uh, uh, you know, um, characteristics of of greatness, but rather uh, by being childlike, by being humble, by being the servant of all. Uh, and then it talks about, um, we get the parable of the lost sheep, which uh, we I think of more uh, in the context of Luke's gospel where it's paired with the parable of the lost coin and the parable of the lost son, also known as the prodigal son. Here it stands alone, and it seems to be serving Matthew's purpose in um, a discourse about church order by saying, uh, if somebody strays and goes away, like, go find them. That's what Jesus would do. Uh, don't, you know, don't forget about them. And now we get today's passage about uh, if somebody in the church sins or sins against you, what do you do? How do you handle it? So that's, that's sort of where we are. Yeah. yeah, and then even after this, next week we'll get to, you know, talking about how often should I forgive somebody. Yeah. And so there's a lot of uh, trying to figure out, you know, how, how are we to be in community with one another and how do we handle when conflict arises? That's right. All this different stuff. Um, and, you know, one of the things, I, I mean, this almost sounds like we're, we're being given this kind of orderly, you know, step-by-step, step, here's how you should handle this, this, and this. It's mm -hmm. not necessarily a blanket statement for just handling anything. But um, one of the things I wanted to kind of kick off and, um, as a, a good way to view this passage, um, somebody talked about this kind of seems a lot like restorative justice. Um, 
because by the end of it, and we'll get there, but it almost says like treat if if you've gotten to the point where the whole co- the whole community is involved and they're still not listening, treat him like an outsider. And that part to me at first was really hard because I was like, oh, we don't want to just get rid of them. Mm-hmm. Um, but if the whole goal is to bring the offender back into community and and find a justice that's restoring things. So when I look deeper, it says restorative justice is really about um, not like a regular justice, which is we punish the offender, lock them up, get them away. Restorative justice is saying someone has been hurt by this, by whatever sin has been committed. And so we need to listen to the voice of those, the person who's been hurt or the community that's been hurt and how they've been affected, bring their voices into conversation with the offender and Together, we, we see how we can find healing for what's happened, but then also bring that offender back into community in some way. Mm-hmm. And so when I hear this, it's really trying to step by step, you know, can, can you just work it out just the two of you at first yeah. and then go yeah. from there? So indeed. So, so today I've got my justice. It's a Jesus thing. You mm-hmm. referenced it one time on a prior podcast, mm-hmm. but I feel like for this, I have to update my shirt. Oh, too. man. To um, up in my game. I don't usually Dang. update my shirts, but there, now I've got restorative justice. How did you get that? Uh, I just printed it out. You printed tape? <laughs> I don't know how to print tape. <laughs> so restorative justice, it's a Jesus thing. That's what, That's I'm, really going. Cool. That's what I'm leading with today. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, John, do you want to kind of start taking us a little bit into um, kind of working through this process that Jesus is outlining here? Yeah, yeah. Um, or if you've got another way you want to go with no, this? No, no, I'm happy to, to go at it that way. First of all, I just think it's worth noting that conflict existed in the early church. In the first iteration, the first generation of, of the church, um, that it's not something that happened later, but that people who knew Jesus and were still gathering in his name disagreed and uh, came into conflict. Now, this isn't about conflict generally. This is about if somebody sins. Mm-hmm. So it's not. this doesn't cover the sort of conflict that, let's say, was between St. Peter and St. Paul about whether we still had to follow uh, the dietary restrictions of the, of the first covenant um, because nobody's sinning on either side. It's just a right. disagreement. But, but this is if somebody uh, sins. And so the church was not only made up of people who disagreed from the ver- very earliest stage. It was made up of people who were imperfect, uh, people who were not fully um, healed of their you know, dysfunction, uh, people who were not fully enlightened. <laughs> right, right. Maybe obvious, but I think worth saying, nonetheless, that there wasn't this era where everybody was uh, perfectly holy and serene and of one accord. But Acts makes it seem so nice <laughs> and perfect. <laughs> For like two minutes, <laughs> <Yeah>. right? <laughs> yeah, you got Acts chapter two, you know, the church sharing everything in common and all of that, but it doesn't take long. We'll start with holding money, things go Exactly, awry. exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this is still real life we're dealing with here. This is still humanity we are dealing with. Um, the, the scriptures don't have a different, different picture in mind. Um, so... Yeah, I think Jesus has a very well thought out and, and, you know, compassionate process here that the ideal is nobody needs to know about it besides the offender and the offended. If it can be worked out at that level, then that's the end of it. Um, There's no interest in public shaming or scandal or gossip or anything like that. I mean, obviously, Jesus Jesus is not into that stuff. <laughs> so that's the ideal. Um, and then if that doesn't work, uh, take one or two others along with you to, t- to talk about it. Uh, and it says, so that every word might be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. This is a, a Jewish idea, uh, probably not exclusively a Jewish idea, but you find it in the Hebrew Scriptures and in, in the book of Leviticus, which is, of course, outlining the Mosaic Law, uh, that... Um, two or three witnesses is the basis on which evidence of something happening, some wrongdoing is admitted um, in, uh, you know, a hearing, you know, their version of a court of law. Um, So Jesus is echoing that tradition there. And so the the idea is always just to contain this as much as possible, not for the sake of secrecy, but just for the sake of, um, you know, not, not distracting uh, the, the community, the church, with um, something that doesn't have to be any of their business. Every little thing <laughs> right. that comes up, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, 
Now, I mean, I, I, as my imagination works through this, I'm thinking, like, what kind of person who wanted to be part of this thing to begin with would be this sort of obstinate? That's, it doesn't really... That's a good point. You know, it, it stays <laughs> abstract here. It doesn't give us an example. But nonetheless, you know, um, if it if this person's, like, not backing down or um, not... not um, not reconciling, then then it's brought before the whole church. Worth noting here that this is uh, the second of only two instances of the word church in all of the Gospels. Mm, it yeah. shows up in the epistles and in Revelation, so that, i.e., the other books of the New Testament. But as far as the Gospels go, um, church only appears twice, and both of those times are in Matthew. Right, right. Um, Last time was. Uh you're right. You're, you shall be Peter, and yes. on this rock I will build my church. And this passage echoes that in more than one way, but we'll, we'll get to that. Oh, I'm looking forward um, to that. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, me too. But this is a Greek word, ekklesia. It was used for centuries before the time of the New Testament to refer to um, gatherings of uh, citizens of a city-state in the Greek or Hellenistic uh, world. Um, so this was just a, a word that was available that... I mean, we could talk about the nuances of it and so on, but but it, it means gathering of, of citizens, in this case, citizens of the kingdom of heaven or something like that. Um, so uh, anyway, if this escalates and the ch- it doesn't get worked out at the church level, uh, th- it says uh, the offender will be to you as a Gentile and tax collector. You mentioned that being hard, but like how did Jesus treat Gentiles right. and tax for, collectors? For Jesus, very well. it was very different. Right, yeah. he, tr- he was very nice <laughs> to them. <laughs> So right. it's Those not really were the outsiders. He yeah. welcomed them in. Yeah, exactly. So I, I see it as um, that if you're in the church, if you've consciously, you know, voluntarily uh, signed on to this thing, then um, you're accountable, mm. right? It's you're walking away, as as um, the Acts of the Apostles talks about it, right? It's not um, it's not just like oh, here's my card, and then I get to do whatever <laughs> I want. Right. You know, I'm in the club. Um, it's it's you're committing to to live a certain way, mm. um, and so therefore you're accountable. But if you're not, you know, walking the way, if you're as it says here, a gentile or tax collector, then yeah, th- it's, it's it almost seems to me as far as Jesus is concerned, it's like it's none of my business what you're doing mm. on some level, uh, you know. So that accountability isn't there, you know. So there, it, there's a sadness there because some you know relationship has been broken, right? Um, because you're not walking the way together. Well, and it sounds like there's this this need to like kind of keep people walking the path, right? Like yeah, that's right. the the community's job is like helping one another, you know, walk this this mm-hmm. path together as they're that's why everybody's kind of, you know, getting involved as they they need to. Yeah. Um I, you know, there were a couple of commentators who both kind of uh quoted the the Spider-Man uh uh, lingo of uh, advice from Uncle Ben with great power comes great <laughs> really? responsibility. That's good. Yeah, it's like here even you I know are, that you one. Know, you guys are the church here, right? You know, right. If if you're trying to to be this in the world, there's responsibility that well comes said. with that. Yeah, for one another. Yeah. And, uh, so I, I, you know, I was like, oh, hey, okay. Yeah. They're speaking my lingo now. I like that. <laughs> yeah. No, I think it it really highlights the tension that exists um, between, on the one hand, you know, the church having an identity and a vocation to be, uh, you know, inclusive and welcoming to all. But on the other hand, that the church has a certain calling to be a certain kind of people, yeah. right? And so, like, not every kind of behavior is cool because the church's vocation is to, um, you know, walk the way of Jesus. And um, Jesus did certain things, and there are certain things he absolutely did not do, Um and I feel like when we're talking about this sort of thing, like, you know, allowed behaviors and disallowed behaviors in the context of religion, people's minds, like, go to sex, basically. <laughs> and certainly that's part of it. But equally, if not more so, it's about, you know, um, you know, it's about how you treat other people. Yeah. Well, yeah. And I, I, you know, it stinks that we skip right over um, some of the other, the other little snippets that you mentioned that come before this. Like, I mean, Jesus talks about the stumbling, that whole thing about stumbling blocks. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, basically, if you're doing things that, if there are things that cause you to sin or cause others to sin, like, cut those things yeah. out, right? I mean, it puts it in a very graphic language. It if does. Your, your hand or your foot, you know, cause you to stumble, cut them off, gouge out your eye. All that fun yeah. stuff. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> really fun. But I, but I, I think there's definitely something too, like you know, walking this path is is looking out for the things that cause us to stumble, that mm-hmm. that put it in the way of others stumbling. Right. Um, right. That's and, right. And one thing I, I I thought was interesting, just going back to um, 
you know, why get in, why get involved in the first place? You know, someone, yeah. <laughs> someone did something to you. Why don't you just uh-huh. say, all right, whatever, you know, I'll, sure. I'll let it go. Yeah. Um, or bring in, you know, other people. Why don't they just say, look, if you guys can't work this out, that's on you. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, one of the things I saw pointed to, um, Leviticus, uh, Leviticus 19 verses 17 to 18. Um, and it's really about, um, not allowing this anger to, to simmer inside, but actually confronting people openly to, to work through that. Because it says, you shall not hate in your heart any mm. one of your kin. Good. Yeah. You shall reprove your neighbor, or you will incur guilt yourself. Mm-hmm. So it's like, you know, like, set them straight here, like, <laughs> or, or it's on you too. You yes. shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people. But, and this we've heard before, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So a lot of familiar wow. language there. Indeed. And I'm like, okay, so that's... That's why, you know, yeah, it's, it's, we're, 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 it's, it's almost saying if you're not helping the sinner, if you're just letting that go or, or you hold anything toward them in your heart toward them, you know, you're, there's sin in you too. Absolutely. From the Sermon on the Mount. Yeah. 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 Indeed. Yeah. I think this is a powerful lesson to us. Um, you know, people, including myself or so many people, not everybody, but I am conflict averse and, um, you know, it's often the easiest way to handle conflict by not handling it. Um, but it has its own corrosive effects regardless of whether it's named. And, and it's often worse if it's not named. And, um, you know, I don't know. I feel like our, our society today, on the one hand, certain, you know, swaths of it have become incredibly, like, unkind and uncivil and, you know, like swearing about (laughs) politicians has become normalized like the things i've seen on people's like yards just like literal profanity about (laughs) the current president and so on like that's become normalized um and that i don't mean that to be political like that could go either way right and it does go the other way but but that's a more recent example perhaps um so uh, on the one hand we've we've become quite uncivil in certain sectors but on the other hand there's like i think a, a culture of like sort of a superficial like niceness mm. that um, is not sincere and it's the other like well-meaning because like people are conditioned to just like, Oh, just, just be nice. Just be nice. You know? And they might, they might have actually more complicated feelings about someone or something that's going on. And um, I totally relate to that. I do that sometimes. I don't like it. Right. <laughs> I mean, some, some of it's yeah. just in us. You yeah. Know? But, uh, but Jesus is pointing out, pointing to a different way. The Hebrew scriptures point to a different way. And, um, it was thought by Greek philosophers as well that frank speech is yes. better than just pretending everything's okay. Right, right. It's much better for everybody involved. Yeah. Absolutely. And, um, and, and to kind of connect with what you were just saying and, and what you said a little earlier, you know, when you said this first thing, you know, handle it privately because mm-hmm. don't publicly shame somebody. I started thinking like this, this is like the, uh, the anti-cancel culture passage. Oh, interesting. <laughs> nice. Nice. In, in the sense that, so, you know, I think things get taken too far, um, not to get divisive and political here, but no, uh, I think there's a difference between <laughs> call-out culture and cancel culture. Definitely. Um, and, yeah. you know, call-out is like, look, if you see something that's wrong, and mm-hmm. that's kind of what it's saying here, like, address it, mm-hmm. bring it up, um, you know, don't let these things just go. Mm-hmm. But to the point, you know, the, the cancel thing kind of is... Uh, the the kind of opposite of what's yeah. going on here is saying, oh, well, you did something wrong. Forget you forever. Mm-hmm. There's no redemption. There's no grace in it. And and you know, that's what that's what's so hard about grace because sometimes we want to be like, yeah, forget you. Um, I know, but yeah. but it's like it's a lot harder to actually work with somebody to stay in uh, mm-hmm. community and 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 work through it. So true. And so yeah. to me, this has such a strong message to it. Uh, what Jesus is kind of advocating for here. So well said. Yeah, I think that's right on target. The the anti cancel culture <laughs> passage. Jesus, cancel culture is not Jesus's way. <laughs> <laughs> John, before I I know we're we're getting close to our time, but I, I want to bring this to 
Um, oh, yeah. You know, yeah. what does it mean to have the, the presence of Christ there, right? So yeah. that this this famous line where there where two or three are mm-hmm. gathered in my name, I am there among them. And there's two of us. We're gathered here to talk yeah. about Jesus. So we made the quota. Yes. <laughs> yeah, Jesus is here. <laughs> Believe it or not, Jesus is here according to his own words. So can yeah. you yeah, please enlighten us a little bit about that? Well, I, I don't know if, how enlightening I can be, but it's obviously a powerful verse. It's a famous verse. Um it's often forgotten that it's connected to this passage, but to my reading anyway, it kind of stands alone. We know that the gospel authors frequently piece together sayings of Jesus that probably weren't uttered consecutively, you know, right. in the same, uh, on the same occasion at the same time. And to me, this reads as one of these, that, that this stands alone, that here Jesus is not talking about um, agreeing about church order or discipline. He's saying, if you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven, which is one of these these uh, efficacy of prayer passages that I think is, is tricky, uh, can be tricky for folks, including mm-hmm. including us. I mean, I'm, I'm certainly not exempt from, from the challenges that, that a verse like that or a claim like that presents. Um, and then he goes on to say, where two or three are gathered, I am there among them. Um, so, I mean, to take the prayer piece to repeat something I recall from a podcast a few months ago. Um, I think it's it, the, the way to make sense of this, if we're to take Jesus at his word, that this is true and also uh, acknowledge the reality that um, a lot of the stuff, you know, that people pray for doesn't come to pass in mm-hmm. the way that it's, it's requested is um, if you Ask, I mean, it doesn't, this language of in Jesus' name isn't here, but you certainly see that elsewhere in the Gospels, such as in John. Um, to ask the Father in Jesus' name for something is to really be asking for God's will to be done in some way. And that, mm-hmm. that might seem like, you know, an evasion and so on. And, and we can't, we just don't have time to get into the intricacies yeah, of yeah. how prayer works and how, um, you know, God's will being done. Uh, uh, is shaped by or not shaped by what human beings ask for in prayer. Yeah. But, um, but nonetheless, it's certainly an invitation to, uh, to be bold in prayer, especially when, when gathered with, with others in Jesus' name. And then, of course, that I am there among you when, when two or three are gathered in, in my name. Uh, it, it's just a powerful reminder that uh, although Jesus is physically uh, absent, at least straightforwardly, you know, bodily absent, um, he is still here. That, yeah. that we are still his people. And that's that's what this whole passage and this whole section of Matthew's gospel is about, that, that Jesus is not sort of, you know, a, a, a one-off uh, movement leader that, you know, oh, wasn't it fun when Jesus got those people together and they were doing this stuff? Yeah, that, those were some good times. The idea is that this is to continue. Yes. And it's to continue not only in memory of Jesus, although that's part of it, but it's con- to continue as Jesus' presence in the world. That Absolutely. when we gather in his name and we walk the way together, he is here. It's he is that, present. It's really living into that uh, Emmanuel name, right? God Absolutely. With us, so. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's nice to know that through through all of this that that he's with us. Yeah. And we're glad that all of you listening, watching, are with all of us. So um, I think that's a great place to kind of bring this in. Thank you all for uh, joining us. We love when you reach out to us with your comments and your questions. Uh, we get a lot of great feedback from everybody. So it helps us to know kind of how we're engaging with you, and we love to hear from that. Um, it's cool. We have, you know, we have clergy from different parts of the world. We have lay people kind of using this for Bible study and with one another or in their own personal kind of devotional time. So please uh, let us know in comments, write to us. We want to hear what you think and uh, be sure to like, share, and subscribe. And we will see you next week. Take care.